everyone. How are you going this week? <laughs> I hope wherever you are, you're um, you're having a great week. And for those of you that have been watching for a little while now, you know that when I jump on these this, these platforms and um, I do my blog each week, it's really about uh, sharing with you some of the frameworks and the strategies that I've used. I try and do a little bit of a teach about some of these concepts uh, that are really important in organizational transformation. Um, sometimes I'm sharing some observations. And then the the other piece to this is really, um, for me, this is a platform for me to start to feel out ideas and to kind of test things out and see what resonates and, I guess, bounce ideas off some of you as well who will respond through comments and emails and that sort of thing. So today is one of those days where I'm feeling out a couple of ideas. So this is not a finished product. This is not, you know... This is not a teach on something that's been done time and time again. This is about me trying to challenge myself to go deeper on uh, this the aspect of organizational change, which I love, which is human behavior. So this is not polished. This is this is going to be pretty raw and and, um, and a bit experimental. So bear with me. But uh, part of why I find human behavior so fascinating is I think it's about... Uh, working out how to get momentum for change in big organizations you know so often we will go in to try and do something and uh there's just there's just this resistance and this this constant pushback and you know it can feel like you're trying to lug this boulder up the hill and then whatever kind of change strategy you've got is about how do I put a peg in so it doesn't roll back down the hill the minute that I take a breath or um, or you know I, I stop pushing and um, and I found myself at loggerheads with uh, people with systems with with the system shall we say on numerous occasions and I've even found myself in situations where we seem to be making great progress but all of a sudden you realize it's almost like a rubber band that's been stretched too far and at some point it snaps and the boulder comes back and just smacks you in the face uh, you know, I've I've had that when I at, at one point I was three years into a change program and all of a sudden work undone within the space of three months. Like it was just incredible how quickly the system snaps back. And I think that's uh, that's the bit that I struggle to put into words. Uh, I struggle to put into you know, you know what's the framework around how we navigate through that. How do we mind ninja our way through some of that stuff? And so. I think a lot of it's to do with the the perspectives that we have in our own head. And uh, some of you might have heard me talk about Conway's Law before, this idea that you will always design from your current perspective. And, and, and that drives my reasoning around why the thinking change is so important. And the best example I've got here is um, if, for example, you had noticed in your organization that you had a problem with driving innovation and you really wanted to unblock that like what we've we've noticed that we've got this roadblock in ideas bubbling to the top and ideas getting put out to market and and how do we kind of build that culture and then based on your own perspective and the perspective of the leaders that are around you you might choose to put in uh, an innovation hub as an example like a um a think tank a place where you're going to start to work with a small group of people and try and drive that innovation and then spread that culture further further throughout more broadly throughout the organization um, and so you identify that you've got a roadblock in your organization for innovation and then your method by which you remove that is to introduce another roadblock to unblock the roadblock because now all of the innovation has to come through this central team in some way to then sort of proliferate back out through the organization so it's that sort of stuff right and we do it without even thinking um and and i think that's part of that like that the systemic inertia um it, it's that it's that little part of me that just wants to rage against the machine um and so you know my approach has been i think i think you best des i'd best describe it as uh, for those of you that have worked with me, you can call me out on this, but it's um, it's an aspiration towards systems thinking on the front end with a customer focus, agile delivery on the back end that iterates quickly and then utilizing those feedback loops to learn. 
And then there's this wrapper around um, all of that, which for me is my why. It's about building compassionate organizations. You know, none of these methods make you a, a compassionate, decent human being. But for me, that's a really core cool part of why I do what I do, because I believe that we have to do that um, and that we, we have to keep fighting that fight uh, for more human conversation, more humanistic organizations. And so that's that's kind of the approach in a nutshell. It's why you hear me start talking about mindfulness and meditation periodically, because you know there's there's that aspect of interpersonal like self reflection that needs to go on, as well as simply getting through the changing the way that we work. For me, that those those things are all intertwined. Um, and in all of that, you know, you start to look at taking this approach of self-reflection, team dynamics, the interpersonal human behavior, like why have, why is it so hard to change the greater ecosystem of our organizations? Um, and I've, I've come up with sort of these three behaviors that I'm working on at the moment that I've noticed are really detrimental and I've, I've tried to put them into words. So the first behavior that I've noticed um, that we talked about last week is this idea of postboxing. So this idea of delegating actions to an individual and then that individual going away and post boxing out to each and every person what they need, waiting for that response to come back, doing the next piece and then posting it out again and, and perpetuating that noise around, you know, I've got 21 things on my plate, I'm going to post one out to Sally and while I'm waiting for that to come back, I'll post one out to Dave. And then Sally still hasn't come back, so I'm going to post something else out to Gina. Um, and, you know, when you have a whole organization that starts doing that, it's incredibly destructive to, um, you know, it, it creates so much noise. And it's incredibly destructive to trust and to teamwork and to collaboration, all of those things. Uh, and I know there'll be a few of you on the on this um, video that are saying, well, you know, that's that's not our organization like we've got past that we've got cross-functional teams but you know that subtlety around the subconscious way of operating that's operating that subtlety around where you are on the spectrum from a post box 21 things to everybody via email through to actually we've set up a cross-functional team but but they're full of engineers and we don't have someone from business and we still need to go out to legal or to finance or to HR for the bits that we need because we're not fully self-reliant like there's a spectrum there right and so the, that post boxing thing's the first thing that I've noticed and so my question is like how do we get through that as leaders how do we undo that behavior not only at one end of the spectrum where um where it's really obvious, but actually at the, the other end of the spectrum where it's subtle. Going back to that example of we see a roadblock for innovation and so we introduce a hub of people that can do that. Well, actually all we're doing is introducing another roadblock to try and solve the roadblock that we see. So it, it's that subtler subconscious bias, um, unconscious bias stuff, as well as fixing it at one end of the spectrum, right? So for me, that's about how do we get to it on a deeper level. So postboxing is the first behavior that I've noticed and been able to put words to around how destructive that is in terms of creating noise, um, you know, driving a, a lack of clarity, um, losing visibility, um, losing the ability to plan because we have to react, all of those things. That's the first one. The second one that I'm going to try and put words to is what I call checking someone else's homework. And uh, this crops up with that question around, well, have you thought about X. Have you thought about? Have you thought about? And it might be as subtle as somebody saying, oh, have you thought about speaking to such and such? Um, or it could be as direct as, you know, somebody in the finance team asking if you've spoken to the legal team or, you know, have you checked up on this legal matter? Like where you've got somebody who's asking a question that's well outside their own scope of practice and their own kind of ability and 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 there's that the checking of someone's homework like have you done your homework by going and checking on this other thing that I've just thought of that you may not have um, again really subtle and and can be very unconscious and not even intentional and I think that's that's the bit that I wrestle with is around 
when it's not intentional, when it's coming from a place of I'm trying to help, I want to um, ensure that we're covering off all bases, I want to make sure that you're successful, but actually what we end up doing is going through this process of checking a bunch of homework, right, and then you map that onto an organizational hierarchy, and so we're checking everybody's homework at every level, and, and leaders find themselves in these conversations where it's checking on someone's homework. Have you done all your homework before I approve this thing? And again, that spectrum from the the really blindingly obvious to the more subtle or, or discreet or subconscious kind of aspect of that behavior. And then the third one that I'm working with at the moment, I'm calling dive bombing. And this for me is like, it's one of those ways that I see the system start to push back. So um, when I'm when I'm working with teams around building collaborative environments, often you get to a point in a in a project or a program where uh, you you find that the system itself is almost acting against you. So uh, you have a situation in which you are trying to do something in the right way, in the, the right way, in the new way. Uh, you know, you're trying to uh, collaborate and build some consensus around a decision. And then what actually happens is that the way that the system operates sort of starts to overlay that and to come into play in a way that you don't expect. And all of a sudden you 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 want to change your method and you want to go back to well, if they're being really coercive and directive in the way that they're making this decision, I just need to go and find somebody. I like, I need bigger, better friends to go and be coercive back and just get it through. So that, and so you start to get into this place of um, the ends justifying the means. And when it gets really hard, do I ditch the method that I've chosen to get a result? And like, where's that line as well? Um, you know, in a similar way to checking on someone's homework, like there needs to be a collaborative conversation, there needs to be that checking have we covered all bases, but that anti-pattern is when it becomes, have you have you checked your homework, have you ticked your boxes? Um, I think Dave Marquette describes it really well in his talk where he, he speaks to leading a submarine and um, implementing, I guess, what he would term servant leadership within a military environment and within a very high stakes environment. Um, and he talks about having people come to him and looking for orders, coaching through that to the point where somebody would come to him and say, I intend to, and he would say, have you checked? And then taking it a step further again, when someone comes to him with, I intend to, and he says, what am I thinking? And so moving through those subtle layers of checking homework. Um, but back to dive bombing. So the that the, one of the examples that I've got of this behavior is we um, when you've got a project up and running or you've got an initiative that you're trying to work through and uh, you bring together a group of people to try and keep track of what's going on, uh, make sure that you've got the visibility, uh, you know, in an agile software delivery kind of uh, environment we would talk about doing a daily stand-up for 15 minutes and we sort of come together and we say what do we do yesterday what are we working on today um, maybe it's a conversation about what we learned um, that, that kind of coordination piece uh, and then so at its best you've got people coming together working through that going away to do what needs to be done um, checking in regularly you've got the visibility the anti-pattern around that of coming to a, a meeting, having it over a period of time too, right? Like it doesn't often happen straight away, but having it over a period of time, it sort of disintegrate into um, action planning. Like who's got this action, ticking that action off. What's the next step? We'll come back in a day or two and, and recheck those actions. Um, and that's not to say, that's not to invalidate the need to be conscious and visible in our progress. But the anti-pattern to needing to solve that problem can be when we find ourselves in a meeting and somebody says, well, where are you up to on that action? And what have you thought about that thing? And it becomes this way of pushing back onto someone and 
the conversation is not actually about progress anymore. It's about, I'm going to nail you because you haven't done your action. And because of the systemic way of operating that's been in place for so long, there's actually this unconsciously or consciously we place more value on did you follow up on your action rather than a conversation about how do we as a team make progress or is that action even valid or like how do we move this forward it becomes that he said she said the that blame and shame type of deal so I'm hoping that I'm articulating this at at least somewhat clearly because it's it's that really messy bit about human behavior that I've I've been wrestling with and this has sort of come up in the past week or two where I've gone no there's these behaviors and again it's the subtlety around pattern anti-pattern so we're not saying that it's not important to work with other people and and to have those conversations like um, in the post boxing example it's not important that the letters get sent it's not not important that the letters get sent those letters still need to be sent but it's how you do that conversation that's the the subtle difference checking people's homework it's not not important to check that we haven't got the gaps covered but the way in which you do that is really important when you're trying to shift thinking and when you're trying to lead a thinking change and following up on actions and making sure that we've got visibility of progress and are we heading in the right direction and are we are we going to get there in time and are we making adequate progress or adequate impact? Those, those questions are not invalid. But the subtlety on how we go about solving those problems is really important. And I think that's that's what I'm trying to get to. So my question for you today is, like, A, does this resonate? Hit me up. Let me know if I'm speaking some crazy talk, um, please comment, (laughs) feedback helps. Um, but like also what other behaviors are you noticing where you've got this existing way of operating that is kind of coming back to bite you. And it's like, you're finding yourself in that situation where you, you want to drop your method. You want to drop your new way of working so that you can just solve it and then you can go back to introducing new ways of working like what are those instances what are those examples what are those situations what like what are those contexts in which you're finding yourself in that behavior because you know when when somebody starts postboxing me I want to scream and grab everybody in a room and go just sort it out right and when I've got somebody that's checking up on all my homework I, again, I want to scream and I want to go just get involved with the conversation or get out. And it probably drives me to then want to check on their homework next time they come to me with something, right? Like it's just so detrimental to trust. And when someone's dive bombing me, honestly, I sit in that meeting and I'm like, my instant reaction is my friends are bigger than yours. So we're going to make it happen. And it's, and I feel myself wanting to go right back to all of those things that I've said I want to change. So what are those situations that are happening for you? Um, and if you've got that level of insight around some of those behaviors that are happening, I'm really, really keen to hear from you because I think this is the stuff that I don't see a lot of people talking about. I will see a lot of people talking about digital transformation, technology strategy. You know, you need to take XYZ precaution and lead change in this way. But I'm not seeing the examples of the behaviors and the the subtlety in the conversation, particularly when you have things like unconscious bias come into play, where, you know, any of those people that might be perpetuating those behaviors are potentially horrified that that is how their behavior is perceived. And so how do we work through that? Um, So, yeah, hit me up. Like, is this making sense? (laughs) And... What are those contexts or those situations where you see yourself wanting to just revert back? When you see yourself wanting to grab onto those reins and just like take control and smash through it. Like when that's, when that frustration hits, what is it that's driving that? And I, I would love to get to, because there's got to be more than three, right? I would love to get to this catalog of here are these behaviors. Like surely that's helpful for other people that are in change programs to go, here are all of these things that we're noticing. Like, keep an eye out for this stuff. 
here's how you deal with it, um, he, or, or here's how this person has dealt with it. I think that's the bit that's really getting me this week. I'm like, what? wouldn't it be cool if we had this catalog of all of these things that we notice that we can kind of start to keep on top of and that we can start to see those weaker signals and those um, those subtleties in the behavior and nip it in the bud before it, it kind of escalates. Um, you know, often when you're starting a change program, you start with the really obvious and you pull it back so far, but it's the undercurrent that's still there and that's where the rubber band snaps back at a later date. So please let me know if you've felt this way before, if you've had a situation where this came up, I'd love to start building this catalog. Uh, I'd love to start having these conversations and talking about it um, because I think it's really important. I think that's the, like, that's the secret sauce, right? How do we, how do we replicate this so that somebody who's new into a change and transformation space can start to understand these are the things that I need to be focusing on rather than coaching agile work methods, the subtlety around the changing and thinking that stuff, how do we get to that? Um, so that's my challenge to you. Please hit me up with a comment or an email, um, you know, on whichever platform you're watching this on. If you're listening to it on the podcast, uh, you know, hit me up, send me an email, comment, share it, have a conversation, come back to me. I'd love to hear from you. And um, I hope wherever you are in the world today, you're having an awesome, awesome day. Um, thanks very much for your time.